Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Shrimad Bhagavatam. Uh, Canto 5, Chapter 15, Text 11. And this is, this Chapter 15 is genealogy coming from uh, Maharaj Bharata and um, coming from the line of Roshabdev. It was Roshabdev, Priyavrata, and Maharaj Bharata, like this, in that, that line of descendants coming from the incarnation of Godhead, the Vishnu incarnation. Everything's coming from Godhead, but this was the Vir- Vishnu incarnation, Shabdha, and then expanding through the descendants. So there were some great personalities that appeared in that line, and one of them was King Gaya. <clears throat> and we're reading about King Gaya's, his, um, his exemplary character as a devotee of the Lord. So, how glorious to Srila Prabhupada. Although King Gaya had no personal desire for sense gratification, all his desires were fulfilled by virtue of his performance of Vedic rituals. All the kings with whom Maharaj Gaya had to fight were forced to fight on religious principles. They were very satisfied with his fighting, and they would present all kinds of gifts to him. Similarly, all the Brahmins in his kingdom were very satisfied with King Gaya's munificent charities. Consequently, the Brahmins consider, contributed a sixth of their pious activities for King Gaya's benefit in the next life. So I believe we read earlier that um, Maharaj Gaya was actually an incarnation also of the Lord, but um, we're seeing here how auspicious everything was in connection with his leadership. He was satisfied with his fighting. The other kings whom he had to, f- to fight were forced to fight on religious principles. So even those that he was fighting with were satisfied with his fighting because it was on religious principles and they would present gifts to him. He was performing Vedic rituals, which is recommended for society to perform these rituals and sacrifices according to the Vedas. This is recommended. And say that he himself had no personal desire for sense gratification. And this was related to his performance of these Vedic rituals. It says all his desires were fulfilled by virtue of his performance of Vedic rituals. He was fully satisfied. Others were satisfied. <clears throat> and the Brahmins were very satisfied with his charities because um, he was giving charity, and they contributed, the Brahmins considered one-sixth of their own pious activities for Gaia's benefit in the next life. So Prabhupada's commentary, as a Chatriya or emperor, Maharaj Gaya sometimes had to fight with subordinate kings to maintain his government, but the subordinate kings were not dissatisfied with him because they knew that he fought for religious principles. Consequently, they accepted their subordination and offered all kinds of gifts to him. <laughs> yeah, there was no enmity there in the fighting. The fighting was taking place on a very high platform, and the kings, they evidently all had uh, very high standards 
And so when they were defeated, because they were defeated on religious principles, they weren't holding a grudge. They weren't demons. The kings weren't demons. But in order to become subordinate, sometimes there was fighting. And when they were conquered, they just like um, when honorable people discourse and one person is able to prove a superior understanding of something to the other one, then the other one will surrender. They're presenting their ideas and their viewpoints, and someone, one of the, in the discussion, one of them is able to prove a higher principle, a higher truth. So the subordinate will become subordinated, and they're happy to do that. They're happy because they've gained something. By being defeated, they've gained something. They've become enriched. They've been allowed to go to a higher platform. So similarly, in a society where the people are um, at least human, <laughs> on the human platform, it's not just the animals fighting over bones, but they actually have values in life, and their, the goal of life is to perfect human life and to reach full knowledge, full bliss, full eternal life when they have these goals. And if there's some fighting either amongst the kshatriyas over who's going to manage things, and then if they're defeated, then they surrender. But because it's on a higher principle, they're very happy to surrender. They're not holding a grudge and when are they going to get back and we need to try to make some conspiracy behind the scenes and undermine it. No, not at all. They just surrender. And they're happy to surrender. This is on a higher principle. Everyone's been taken to a higher plane. So their defeat was not a shameful thing. It was an elevating thing. And so they become subordinate to the, to the ruler. And this was what was going on. I've, evidently with Maharaj Gaya. I mean, everyone benefited when they took the subordinate position. But for Chhatris to do it had to be some fighting, just like when um, the Brahmins <coughs> or the, um, the leader, the intellectual class of society may argue someone's going to be defeated, but it will be for everyone's benefit. Their defeat will bring them to something higher. So, uh, let's see. Yeah. Consequently, they accepted their subordination and offered all kinds of gifts to him. Similarly, the Brahmins who performed Vedic rituals were so satisfied with the king that they very readily agreed to part with one sixth of their own pious activities for his benefit in the next life. The Brahmins and the Kshatriyas were all satisfied with Maharaj Gaya because of his proper administration. In other words, Maharaj Gaya satisfied the Kshatriya kings by his fighting and satisfied Brahmins by his charities. The Vaishyas were also encouraged by kind words, affectionate dealings. And due to Maharaj Gaya's constant sacrifices, the Sudras were satisfied by sumptuous food and charity. In this way, Maharaj Gaya kept all the citizens very satisfied. When Brahmins and saintly persons are honored, they part with their pious activities, giving them to those who honor them and render them service. Therefore, as stated in Bhagavad Gita, Tadviti Pranipatena Paripasnena Sevaya, one should try to approach a spiritual master submissively and render service unto him. Now that's interesting. To hear that when Brahmins and saintly persons are honored, they part with their pious activities, giving them to those who honor them and render them service. Hmm. Wow. So that's um that's like a chat giving something in charity. They're giving their own pious activities. to those who honor them and render them service. Like uh, getting paid as a payment or exchange. There's an exchange there. 
give their own pious activities. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, people like in the Vedic culture, like in India, they understand how that that's what happens. And so when they see a saintly person, they know they can get some benefit. So they'll try to touch their feet or crowd around them or something to try and get some of that um, good energy, that pious results of that person's pious activity. They want some of it. And um, so sometimes... Uh, the saintly persons, they, they don't want to be so much in a crowd <laughs> because they can get rushed like that. You know, we see that sometimes with Prabhupada. They make a dive for the saint's feet. But um, that's there. It's undeniable. Prabhupada explains here it's undeniable. But um, it can be a little overdone, too. It, it can be quite a bit overdone because that saint has a mission and to spread Krishna consciousness, um, not just to hand out pious acti- results of pious activities. So we don't want it to get in the way of his mission. And uh, But we've seen that, and they understand how that works. Text 12. In Maharaj Gaya's sacrifices, there was a great supply of the intoxicant known as Soma. King Indra used to come and become intoxicated by drinking large quantities of Soma Ras. Also, the personality, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, the Yagna Purush, also came and personally accepted all the sacrifices offered unto him with pure and firm devotion in the sacrificial arena. Wow, even the demigods were pleased with Maharaj Gaya. They came and used to drink the soma that was in the uh, sacrifice. And you come and get intoxicated (laughs) by drinking large quantities. So the demigods were pleased, the chachis were pleased, Brahmins were pleased, the Vaishas were pleased, the Sudras were pleased, and even the Lord himself would come, Yagna Purush, and accepted all the sacrifices because they were offered to him, and here it is, with pure and firm devotion in the sacrificial arena. So this is Maharaj Gaya. He's a devotee of the Lord. You can see everyone's pleased by his activities. Prabhupada's commentary, Maharaj Gaya was so perfect, he satisfied all the demigods who were headed by the heavenly king Indra. Lord Vishnu himself also personally came to the sacrificial arena to accept the offerings. Although Maharaj Maharaj Gaya did not want them, he received all the blessings of the demigods and the Supreme Lord himself. Yeah, so he wasn't doing these things so that he could get something. He was doing these things out of his own devotional mood of love for the Lord. He was doing these out of service to the Lord. To see the Lord happy was his pleasure. But even though he didn't want them, he was receiving the blessings of the demigods and the Supreme Lord. You know, we see that happen sometimes, like Dhruva Maharaj. Originally, he had some strong desires, wanted a kingdom greater than his father's. But when he had darshan of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he didn't want those things. He just wanted to serve the Lord. But the Lord um, gave him benedictions anyway even though at now he didn't even want them anymore. He gave them anyway. So, 
It just comes. It can come with the, the devotion. It just comes. No need to make big endeavors separately f for things by engaging in the service of the Lord. Whatever is needed comes. The devotee is never vanquished. You just have to have that. You just have to get to that point. You can really, really surrender to that and, and realize it. And our life become perfect. But the Lord is the maintainer, and He will maintain, He does maintain. Text 13. When the Supreme Lord is pleased by a person's actions, automatically all the demigods, human beings, animals, birds, bees, creepers, trees, grass, and all other living entities, beginning with Lord Brahma, are pleased. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is the super soul of everyone. He is by nature, and he is by nature fully pleased. Nonetheless, he came to the arena of Maharaj Gai and said, I'm fully pleased. Uh, so we hear that watering the root of the tree, all the leaves and branches uh, get the uh, benefits of the watering by watering the root. So Lord Vishnu, Supreme Lord, is the root of the big tree. He's, he's the cause of everything. He's the root of everything. He's maintaining everything. He's created everything, and in the end, he'll destroy everything of the material creation. He'll wind up the the re, the um, the reflection. He winds up the reflection through matter. So he is always fully pleased in himself. He's always fully satisfied. But still, he came to the arena of Maharaj Gaya and said, I'm fully pleased. Why did he, he's fully, he's already fully satisfied. Why did he come? Because he was attracted by the devotion of Maharaj Gaya. Commentary. By Prabhupada. It is explicitly stated herein that simply by satisfying the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one satisfies the demigods and all other living entities without differentiation. If one pours water on the root of a tree, all the branches, twigs, flowers, leaves are nourished. Although the Supreme Lord is self satisfied, he was so pleased with the behavior of Maharaj Gaya that he personally came to the sacrificial arena and said, I'm fully pleased. Who can compare to Maharaj Gaya? Krishna. Text 14 and 15. In the womb of Gayanti, Maharaj Gaya begot three sons named Tritrarata, Sugati, and Avarodhana. In the womb of his wife, Erna, Tritaratra begot a son named Samrat. The wife of Samrat was Utkala, and in her womb, Samrat begot a son named Marichi. In the womb of his wife, Bindumati, Marichi begot a son named Bindu. In the womb of his wife, Saraga, Bindu begot a son named Madhu. In the womb of his wife, named Sumana, Madhu begot a son named Viravrata. In the womb of his wife, Boja, Viravrata begot two sons named Mantu and Pramantu. In the womb of his wife, Satya, Mantu begot a son named Bovana. And in the womb of his wife, Dushana, Bovana begot a son named Tvasta. In the womb of his wife, Virochana, Tvasta begot a son named Viraja. The wife of Viraja was Vishuchi, and in her room Viraja begot one hundred sons and one daughter. All of these sons, of all of these sons, the son named Satajit was prominent, predominant. 
So there's no purport there, and um, we're getting the genealogy. We're going down now through the generations, originally coming from Maharaja Shabdev. Text 16. There's a famous verse about King Viraja. Because of his high qualities and wide fame, King Viraja became the jewel of the dynasty of King Priyavrata, just as Lord Vishnu, by his transcendental potency, decorates and blesses the demigods. Prabhupada's commentary, within a garden, a flowering tree attains a good reputation because of its fragrant flowers. Similarly, if there is a famous man in a family, he's compared to a fragrant flower in a forest. Because of him, an entire family can become famous in history. Because Lord Krishna took birth in the Yadu dynasty, the Yadu dynasty and the Yadavas have remained famous for all time. Because of King Viraja's appearance, the family of Maharaj Priyavatra has remained famous for all time. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the fifth canto, fifteenth chapter, Srimad Bhagavatam, the glories of the descendants of King Priyavrata. <laughs>